All right, I guess we are live. There's some errata. I'll get out of the way right away. Um, we'll start with the hot sauce. I do have a hot sauce here. And I'll read all the messages. Hello, hello. Greetings from Germany. Germany, Italy, uh, around the globe, all kinds of places. That's awesome. We have some of this uh, blueberry sauce. And I thought about it today because, you know, now that the colder months are coming in, I actually do enjoy occasionally having some pancakes or waffles in the morning. And uh, blueberry ghost pepper sauce. I tell you, this is actually really good on pancakes. It's, it's really amazing. So I will probably get the hiccups if I eat it right now. It is actually kind of spicy, but I don't know. I don't like breakfast foods as much uh, in general, but I do like pancakes with coffee in the mornings on cold mornings. They just seem like they go together. So that's my hot sauce recommendation is blueberry ghost pepper sauce. And this is from uh, Bravado Spice Company, which by the way, I haven't found anything from Bravado Spice Company that I don't like. I love all the stuff from Bravado. I'm really, really happy with it. They make a lot of them. I've talked about a few of their hot sauces before. Next piece of errata while everyone joins and hits that like button and all that fun stuff here is um, lights on or lights off. I bring it up because in I don't, she's not in tech. We'll throw that out there first. My wife does not work in tech. She's a banker. So her opinion about tech stuff may be skewed, but one of the specific things she has said on numerous times, I like it better when the lights are on with the video as opposed to when I'm dark. She says it looks all weird when it's like darker and I have more uh, contrast behind me. I'm actually making it look like, well, how most every YouTuber looks, I would say in 2020. Uh, so I, and I turn the video lights up like this. This is the lights on mode because when I'm reviewing product, it's easier to see the product. Um, so I don't know. Is there anyone have an opinion on that? No one ever comments on that at all because I don't think it's relevant. My wife thinks it's relevant. So, <laughs> so that's, a, that's about it. I didn't know if anyone had an opinion. So I thought the, the early people are the people who probably watch my shows the, or watch my videos the most. Therefore, they're the people that may care. Um, yeah. Yeah, wife usually prefers the lights off, but <clears throat> my wife likes the lights on. What does that say? <laughs> can I dim it? Oh yeah, I mean, there's knobs all over the place. So I can, this is, there's, um, my studio, there's different lights all out of range. So they have adjustments and things like that on there. So that's a thing. So anyway, <laughs> status LEDs. Sure, we'll talk about those too, because we have lots of status LEDs we can look at. I got this little guy next to me here. Um, I do like this FreeNAS Mini X. I've been a little busy with all the other things that I've been involved with. Uh, matter of fact, just before, I, this is my second live stream of the day. The <clears throat> first backup, uh, first live stream was uh, done with Solar Winds. So me, um, Solar Winds and uh, Hunter Slabs all joined for a live stream just a little while ago. So maybe some of there's a crossover audience of people that are here that were on that webinar. And that was a specific webinar. It's, that's not something on YouTube. Um, so that's just what we were talking about uh, frameworks for cybersecurity and well, security in general for your company. And I don't, you know, I don't cover that topic as much on my channel. Maybe I should, but it's a good one. Um, to me, it was a little more fun because it's directly related were the seven most common reasons MSPs get pwned, which is a video I released yesterday. And uh, that's that's kind of fun. It's, it's, it's a more formal because it was a business environment. So it's a more formal talk we did about the framework. And I believe it's all free. I, it's, I'm tagged in it on Twitter. I retweeted it. Uh, so if you find that, you can, you can go get it and they'll still send you the webinar uh, that we all did. And we just talked about framework and things like that. William Daughtery, thank you for the donation and please discuss more business talk. That is on my to-do list as well as uh, diving into some business talk. So yeah, I can't link to the live stream because um, they won't have it available for two more days and then they send it out with the people who register for the webinar. I don't know because it's their game. I don't get to record it. They record it. I'm a guest. Um, different animal. Like it's not I can't just link to it. And I always ask, cause I don't know why they don't throw these things up on YouTube, but no, nah, their corporate people are their corporate people. Um, maybe I can 
bring them over to the enlightened side, in my opinion, of, hey, why don't you throw this on YouTube so, so people can watch it, guys? I mean, we went through the trouble of creating it, you send it out, and cool, you have all the live webinar people that got to Q&A with us. There's probably a lot of people that would watch that and post, and it's good content, so. Can I quickly explain what Solar Winds is? Matter of fact, I can't. I've done some reviews on their products, but we're gonna specifically show you <clears throat> the specific things I'm talking about with Solar Winds, and that's this right here. Solar Winds MSP Managed Service Provider is what that acronym stands for. For those of you that don't know, and uh, it is the Solar Winds RMM tool is more specifically what we're talking about. But what these are is tools that allow us to manage clients at scale. So what we do here is we have people who contract us to take care of all their IT needs on a recurring monthly bill. <clears throat> Let me get, all right, microphone I just realized was twisted. I don't know if it makes much of a difference. Um, but the, uh, they pay us on a monthly contract, monthly bill to take care of all their cybersecurity issues, investigate threats and things like that that may come onto their network. So they pay us to keep them secure. This is part of the tooling stack that we use to facilitate the handling of all those computers in an automated way. And that's, you know, an interesting thing if you've not worked in technology long, um, you, you don't think about it as much as someone maybe who's worked in it for 25 plus years like I have. We used to just throw more people at the problem, run around dealing with it, getting up from your desk, going to a workstation and fixing stuff. And really here in 2020, <clears throat> Sorry, I need to drink water here. We, um, a lot of what we do is automation. We let the systems automatically filter through the noise, apply everything on the most automated processes you can, run scripts to uh, push updates or check for status of things or uninstall things, um, give us the status of all those things. I've reviewed the SolarWinds software. If you look for that review, you can actually see what it looks like in action. And I'm going to do some new videos on it because... Well, a lot has changed and uh, they've added, it does everything it did in the video plus more. So um, that's what that is. That is the tooling that enables us to manage uh, many computers all across the United States. And I don't know yet, uh, we don't currently have any, we do consulting overseas, but we don't have any clients on our managed overseas because that we're, we're unclear where the legalities may lie on that. So we have to tread lightly. Someone asked me if we do that. I've only ever had one request and it's been, I said, I don't know. So I haven't dug into it. It was a small request and it wasn't a solid deal. So I didn't contact to see what laws needed to be dealt with when you um, have a recurring contract overseas. I, I don't know what translates to what and how that works because we're crossing international borders. But so, uh, careful, their sales rep will never forget you. Yeah, that's true with like any of these companies. That's that's the risk of. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't mind. I mean, we get vendor calls all the time. I kind of shrug my shoulders. One, that's why vendors never get my cell phone. Not that having my cell phone even matters. I screen 100% of the calls that come to my cell phone and only listen to them in post. Uh, two, eh, they don't bother me much. I mean, we get vendor cold calls all day here. I'm really not that big of a deal. Uh, why is my phone going off so much? Nothing important. So hold on. Clear this. I just forgot to turn it off. All right, now it's off. Matter of fact, the things that do make my phone go off is messages to my phone, but certainly not phone calls. Um, my wife, she gets mad sometimes because the she tried to call from her work number, and the only people you have to be in my phone book in order for my call to uh, for my phone to ring, and even then I mute it all the time. So yeah. Well, I know SolarWinds does offer GDPR and overseas. It's it's the way, if, if there's whether or not there's any conflicts with the way we do it. And um, so I don't know. I, I just haven't really dug into it, but we've not had any solid offers to make it where I want to dive into that side of it. Oh, let's see. Someone filled the form out a few weeks ago. Oh yeah, like I said, it varies. Some salespeople are more aggressive than others. And I believe they break them out into regions, um, it would be my guess. I don't know. I think so. I never really asked. We've had the same sales. We, I mean, we change salespeople because we've been with them for so many years. But we don't, they know me really well. So they're not hounding me for anything because they know I do videos. And they know I know the product. So, uh, um, we have people who deny 
things. We just, you make them um, in writing acknowledge that they're using an insecure thing and it's not my problem. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. There's kind of a mix. If someone's too crazy and want to do something that's just absurdly stupid, we may not even want them as a client. We usually never have anyone like that under any type of agreement. They're usually just break fix people. Uh, we have that more than anything. We have some break fix people that they call us whenever there's a disaster and um, that's it. We clean up whatever mess they have and they go to sleep again. They never actually fix it any further, which means they spend money again cleaning it up and whatever. I mean, hell, I got a company that they spent thousands and thousands on just labor of cleaning up messes that should have been stuff they've replaced, but they choose not to. So eh, it happens. You kind of get to make your choices of how much you want to deal with those people. Uh... Well, yeah, and if they, you don't want to have them blaming you and things like that. That's why they're not ever someone that has some any type of agreement with them. They're usually just call. That's we we still take a lot of break fix clients. Um, we're we're doing the MSP thing, but a big part of our work is consulting. But then there's another piece of our work, which is the random one off people that call us when something breaks. And I don't know. To me, those are usually long term clients. Uh, there's one of them, uh, more than one, just over the years. A lot of them that start as being those pain in the butt, do everything half-ass, create drama, and eventually they flip into being um, managed service clients. Something happens at the company, they suddenly get serious about it, changes in ownership, changes in management, and the next thing you know, or sometimes clients get hit hard, and then they go, wow, that hurt. That hurt a lot more than that minor issue. It just blew up into a big issue, almost put us out of business, we survived, let's get uh, contracts in place and put this together right. Oh, uh, let's see. Let's see. What do you think would be possible to replacing? Uh, would it be possible to uh, re replicate a NAS build that you have on the desk? Any suggestions about the hardware? Um, I don't know. I'm not. I am far, far from an expert. There's the free NAS forums are a place to ask about the best NAS builds. We hardly build them at all ever anymore. Pretty much, we buy them. And uh, because of that, because we've been buying these systems here and I have a Synology just out of reach here. So we do, I did the comparison. We like both products. Uh, we, ju we generally buy one that's turnkey. So it, it's the few extra dollars. If you're, if you're really budgeting, yeah, you can save some money. From a business environment, it's just been easier the last few years. I have a, years ago I did a build and it still works. Um, it's just the price points have now fallen here in 2020 that these are fairly reasonably priced, so. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I mean, you can build a very reliable one. It's more of the, um, if you don't spend all your time doing it, but if you spend time in the forums, there's people who do all the deal hunting. They know which cases um, these are, so to speak. They reverse engineer and figure, oh, you can buy this case and this board fits it well. Because that's actually another pain in the butt part. And uh, our, with our what our billable rates are, if we spend a bunch of time trying to fit a motherboard in here that fits better with the power supply, that fits better with this. And hey, don't get me wrong. There are a ton of YouTube channels dedicated to piecing things together. And it's a lot of fun. It's whether or not you have the time to do it. And sometimes I just don't. That's the shortest answer I can give on that. So, um, is it safe to install 6022? Yeah, we should talk about that. I don't think so yet. And uh, I was actually poking around here in the Unify forums and I, I don't have the clearest answer yet about this. So a lot of people saying I would hold off on six. Now, me and Riley, um, I didn't have enough time because he had some appointments today to really engage some more, but there was a couple of things he pointed out that might be interesting uh, and might cause a problem. And I might sandbox this one and set up um, my lab systems on a special install of it to see how that looks. And the reason I bring this up, so what we noticed is the one other little caveat about 6022. So they seem to have fixed like the, the major issue, but it's the small things that'll add up. Uh, Unify bases all their stuff on MongoDB. So let me go ahead and actually we'll run through this together. We're going to actually log into my Unify controller, the one still running the old version, and uh, talk about this here. And 
let's switch. So the challenge with the Java and the MongoDB and everything that it uses is how much memory Mongo uses. Because Mongo starts pulling up and using a lot more memory as it scales up, one of the things we do in our Unify system is you don't need the is density of the logs and some of that granular data. And the reason why is because, well, when you start hosting a lot of sites, one, that data is not particularly you know, useful to have really fine time slice data um, in there. So you just turn the logging levels down a little bit. You're still logging, but you're not logging um, that high density logging. My understanding, and I have not got until I set up a sandbox, this is uh, from Riley, who's digging into this, and we're still early in the process. Um, they turned up the logging. So my question is, we're trying to figure out if by turning up the logging and actually they eliminated some of the low logging options, is that going to cause MongoDB to kind of spiral out of control and take more data than it should and cause a big problem? So yeah, we don't see the problem now with 6022 that we did in 6020 where there was all these weird VLAN issues and a bunch of uh, broadcast storms because of some bridging problems. But did we create another problem where it creeps up on you when you have you know, 55 or 58 sites that we have in one single controller. And Riley is the expert in this as far as I'm concerned because he does Hostify. And that's what I'm talking about when I say Riley is he is the owner of Hostify. We've done a review on the product. Yes, uh, I have an affiliate link below if you want to sign up for Hostify. Full disclosure here as I always try to do. But um, Riley kind of relies on some of those uh, functions for hosting these controllers so they don't get too big. And he does fine tuning of the Mongo da database manually as part of his hosting package. That's one of the ways he's able to do this and keep it very optimized. And we're not clear on where we're at with that. So he's working on it and uh, me and him are going to get together soon and probably even do a video breakdown of what might be different and or how to mitigate it because there are ways you can tune the MongoDB database. It's completely not officially documented and not supported by them, but if this is something we have to do, I need to know because I can't switch to 6022 uh, even if it did fix those problems because if it creates another problem where all that data and MongoDB suddenly needs more space than I can allocate to it or just crashes because of its size because it can't handle that many, we're going to have to start looking at alternate options of hosting it. Do we split the controllers or do we just manually mitigate it by flipping the switches in the MongoDB that turn those features off? We need those answers before we switch. Um, Unify got a little ambitious, I think, with this one. Um, Martin Gonzalez, thank you for the donation. And thanks, uh, his, Martin says, thanks for the answer. Not all clients are good clients. He, yes, not all clients are good clients for sure. 6022 didn't really help according to Willie. Willie, I've talked to you on this as well. He's certainly, um, uh, like, Willie's in my shoes dealing with it from the it's on fire. It's on fire problem <laughs> and people calling. So that's definitely a thing. Uh, if they want a document store DB, no, they need to, if they really want to do this right, they should get off of Mongo and move to MariaDB. That would be much more idea. MariaDB is much more scalable and more robust. The challenge comes from people like me or Riley who are trying to do things at scale for clients and manage it. That's where Mongo really shows its shortcomings. Now, Riley's done a lot to mitigate it. Um, we're just keeping only X amount of clients. And right now, we, it has no problem at all. Matter, matter of fact, like I said, let me flip back over to that. Um, you can see that this server is not exactly loaded up. Look at the load averages are very, very little. The big thing it's using right now is my controller with that many people on it uses 4.7 gigs of RAM. There's nothing else that runs on this. This is a bare, very minimal load of Debian plus the controller. All the memory usage and everything else on here is all related to that. Just It's just Unify. Matter of fact, look, you can look and see what it's doing. It's Unify and Mongo. That's what's running on this computer. There's really Unify Mongo, Unify Mongo, Unify Mongo. That's what runs on this. That's all the processes. That's where all the memory is. Oh, and here's my one SSH session. So you can see, literally, I don't run anything else on here. So this is just doing that uh, and using 4.7 gigs of RAM. This is, this is not barely using like a couple megabytes for the OS. Everything else is dedicated to that. So I care a lot about what happens on the scalability of, of that. 
So hopefully that makes um, makes a little bit of sense. Ah. Uh, Yeah, it kind of depends um, on the use case. So some people seem to have no problems at all. People saying it works great from scratch. Uh, I don't know the answer to make it easy. Um, why do I have it on a box I maintain rather than hostify? because I like managing things. I don't mind managing Linux servers. We manage a whole stack of Linux servers um, I, because I can manage it myself. I outsource some things. I outsource my accounting. I don't want to manage my accounting. I am a DevOps guy. I am a Linux sysadmin and have been for since uh, 1998 is when I did it in an official job capacity. My first Linux, like what I had to do for a living was help manage Linux servers. So after 22 years of managing Linux servers, I'm kind of fine with managing Linux servers. Uh, so I don't mind, you know, putting them out there. The, uh, I recommend Hostify because people, what they tell me is they go, well, I don't want to spend the money um, I want to manage it myself and just grab a DigitalOcean droplet. Oh, cool. You still have to maintain it. You still have to update it. You still have to do version updates. You still have to do your backups. And they go, but I don't want to do any of that. I just want to pay DigitalOcean $5 a month to do it. And I'm like, no, there's a lot that goes into it. And Riley is a lot more than $5 a month at Hostify. Hostify does have a cost with it. They give you great support. They give you a really solid, they control the upgrade. They're doing all this research on the back end. There's a lot to it, but I don't mind doing this myself. So you have to weigh out. Are you a Linux person that can do this yourself? Are you someone who can manage your own stack? That may not be a yes answer, and that's okay. I don't fault people who don't want to do it, who don't want to learn it because they're focusing on something else. That's perfectly fine. Um, you have to figure out there is only a finite amount of time each day. You have to figure out what's worth it for you and what's not worth it for you. Um, I hate running mail servers. I outsource my mail servers because that's easier for me. I used to be a mail server admin. Actually, that's what I used to manage in Linux. I find that easier to outsource. And there's probably someone, well, I'd rather run my mail server. Then go for it, dude. I mean, I'm fine with it. <laughs> so, uh, wasn't shaped for... Uh, wasn't shaped for scalability might be a point. I think they didn't realize the popularity of their... Uh, product, but they built it to be multi-tenant so I can have all of these in one system. So they built it out like that, which is great, but obviously that is going to come with some challenges. And I don't know. Uh, why do I think Unify is taking so long for Wi-Fi 6? Uh, Unify is a company, um, I don't know. They, they are of their own mind is the best way I can describe it. Why, why has there been a request for five years to have multiple IPs on a WAN uh, of, a, of all of their routing equipment? Pfft, I don't know. That's not hard to implement. It's at the fundamental level. Uh, you can get to the command line and, you know, monkey with it. They've chose in five years never to update their software to add that feature. I don't know why. It's a mystery. Why not have better OpenVPN support? It's... Their hardware is capable of it. They've chose to just omit it. And that's open source. They can wrap it right in without a big deal. I don't know. They are not someone who, um, um, I, I don't know. They just don't do it. Why don't I containerize it? Why would I containerize it? What's the advantage? So instead of running in a container, I run it natively on a uh, bare metal VM. I just, no, no, I could stick all my VMs in containers. And then we can have that debate of what's safer, containerizing or virtualizing each thing into its own uh, com completely independent VM so there's less chance for lateral movement. That's a, I'm partial to the full VMs because I'm not resource strapped. I'm partial to containerization when you want to take a single machine that's usually virtual anyways and then drop all the containers and use something like Docker to do it. Kind of depends on what you want to do. So. I'm fine with not containerizing it um, and doing it the way we did it. I mean, I guess if I was going to break every client into their very own individual VM, then it would make more sense. Because if we have like 60 clients roughly on there on this particular controller um, running 
60 VMs doesn't make sense. Running 60 containers might be a little bit more efficient because there's certain shared resources, but we don't do it that way. Um, but who knows with 6.0, who knows with the way Unify is going, which way we'll end up having to modify things, but I don't really foresee that as that big of an issue. Uh, sorry, what is that? Um, yeah, whatever fits the need for the project. MongoDB is scalable. I don't think it scales as much as MariaDB, but I mean, it's it's usable. It all depends on how it's implemented. The other puzzles we unify is are using older versions. So anyways. Um, TrueNAS. Let's mention that. So we're at the um, release one of this. People keep asking about TrueNAS scale. It's way down the road. It's The can has been kicked. We're looking at January release dates for something probably usable. Um, I'm not going to dive into using MongoDB externally just to try to host the Unify stuff. That is what Riley does. Um, but yeah, they for the most part, uh, I'm not... Uh, we don't have that need to go there. If I needed to go there, I would probably work with Riley to put something that together. If like if I had this challenge, because that's his focus. Right now, it's easy. I just run it in a single VM. We've literally had no problems. The only time we've run into issues is the 6.0 upgrade, which is why we didn't do it. It didn't pass our own testing uh, or anyone else's really. And uh, then there's the concern that I will work with the greater internet as a whole, including Hostify, to determine if there's any issues going forward running 6.0, and then we'll talk about it. Um, yeah, it's really cool. I mean, Riley's definitely the person I would talk to. He's not the only one I've talked to about it. Uh, he's learned a lot about it, and there's other people in the community you can find that are less known, but they've done that too. Uh, matter of fact, one of my friends, he's a DevOps engineer, and he did some really interesting things with it as well related to MongoDB and related to some auto deployment features he came up with. Uh, he does it on his own just because he's doing something. But um, get, let's get back to the true NAS topics. I can only just beat the dead horse that is ubiquity. I will admit, though, I'm laughing at the people who go, this is it, end of the company. I have to throw all my ubiquity equipment away. Oh, no. And I'm sitting there going, what? And oh, especially the, the other people. I will address them, too, that are, this is why you go Fortinet. And I'm like, really? Fortinet? Who... I have an entire video on all the egregious, poor programming practices and disasters by Fortinet. Or, or oh, the Juniper, those guys, you know, who just had some CVE-9s, yeah, for um, privilege escalation off their portals. Every company, and it's not to dog the ones I just mentioned, every company is on these lists for flaws, just to say. And you probably don't hear because end users get their hands on ubiquity equipment. End users don't buy Juniper. So you don't hear about these other issues unless you're just following CVEs and security bulletins. Um, these other companies are, I'm not going to say, I don't know, as bad, probably as bad would probably be a good way to say it. There has been some egregious problems with all these major suppliers of hardware that have certainly made messes. Um, Ubiquity is noisier from a community standpoint because anybody can go to Amazon and buy Ubiquity and then complain about it online and actually own the product. You can't do that. Not End users are not running out and buying a Fortinet. So the Fortinet problems, especially the massive holes in their VPN that they had, which is like crazy. Um, that particular was one of the worst CVEs that I think they did because they actually mixed up a code base between something a customer asked for that then got accidentally pushed to everyone else's production code. I mean, that's just a disaster. And I mean, how do you even look at a company like that going, you're publicly, I think they're publicly traded. They're a billion dollar company either way that you pay very good money for that screwed up hard. <laughs> so, yeah. Has Fortinet had any new flaws? It's been a little while since I looked uh, to see where they're at. I, I rarely run into them. I just ranted. I have a video where I ranted about all the ones they've had. And I think some of them were even this year. Um, they were just really sloppy uh, internal engineering problems. They were not, they were not like coding's hard. They made a mistake. They were like, what the hell went on at this place? Hard coding passwords and firewalls and things like that. This is stuff that should have never passed a clean DevOps team. So that's why I ranted about it. Anyways, um, 
Do do do. What else? Someone asked Ann uh, about QNAP. The only thing I'll mention, um, I have talked to, I don't use QNAP, which is, uh, everyone keeps asking me to use it. I have no interest in using it. Anyone I do know who's used it tells me the same thing. It's like a much buggier version of Synology. I've had that told to me by a lot of people. We have switched people off of it and um, it seems to have more security issues uh, just from the general consensus of security postings that are out there. I can't tell you this objectively because I haven't used it, but I seem that people are happier with Synology and we get calls and have you know, consulted with people moving from QNAP to Synology and more so QNAP over to FreeNAS. Uh, so I, I don't know. I don't have enough objective information. Subjectively, uh, the noise in the market seems to be that the QNAP is not quite what the Synology is, but it does seem to be on par with some of the features that Synology does offer. But I, I don't have an interest in using it. We like the Synology. I'm familiar with the offering. We've deployed it. It's got a good track record of reliability. So we're, we like it, just like we like FreeNAS. So that's my QNAP uh, comments. Um... I've no, nothing, nothing about them I looked at made me go, oh man, if only these other guys had this killer feature that QNAP has, I would use it. There's nothing about it that made me go say that. So, um, on to TrueNAS scale. Um, uh, to do. Uh, Exponology is interesting. I would never use it in production. So, it's cool if you want to play with it. Um, I never played with it. I, th I think it's a neat concept. Uh, it's community supported, but not commercially supported. So it's not as, it's not something I would deploy in production. And I'm also, um, I'm also not clear on some of the tools like active backup because they make you go to Synology site to register to turn a feature on. I'm assuming, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, because I just don't know, um, you can't do that in Exponology. And that's one of the reasons we like Synology is the fact that the active backup system works. But I figure that's why it goes out to Synology site and does that registration to turn on. So it's it, it's like, if I didn't get those features, why would I even want it? I mean, because I like Synology for features that they have, um, not features that you know might be missing. So, yeah. Uh, How do you fire clients um, that are a pain in the butt? We just tell them to go away. Yeah, scale. Now, getting back to the other topic I want is uh, TrueNAS scale. I think it's really cool um, to... Release date. I know they just updated the roadmap for it. And I'm excited about this. So, um, they're hoping in 2021 is right now what they're saying. This is over on storage review. Uh, I really love this in concept. Now, someone had commented, well, now they're in up with two code bases again. Yes and no. Um, one of the things that's going to be the same on scale is they compartmentalized the middleware. And that was a big thing. So it actually would have been even harder if they didn't do this already, but they've compartmentalized the middleware. They're combining TrueNAS and FreeNAS into a single product. Now, once you compartmentalize the middleware, that means swapping out the kernel and you know the fundamental base operating system doesn't matter. They moved to the same version of OpenZFS that's gonna be on Linux and on, and on BSD. That's all that compartmentalizing. So now it's gonna be a drop-in. The only tooling change when you talk about a code base that's going to be different is the Docker versus IO cage because, well, that's fundamentally different. So I know people are a big fan of Docker. And this is where Synology has kind of an advantage running Docker because the Docker hub has so much out there. So from a developer standpoint, I make a box that supports Docker and let the Docker community create all the cool stuff. And then you can just, you know, pull those Docker uh, images in and get whatever neat thing you want running on your NAS running. This is a great reason for Docker. I understand that argument completely and it's you do it properly. And right now with IO Cage, that's one of the challenges they've had on the BSD side is keeping up with 
you know, getting developers to get the latest version of software, package it together so they can pull it in the IO cage. The jail system is nice, it's efficient, it's on par in many ways with Docker. It just doesn't have the community support that Docker does. So I completely get it that um, with TrueNAS scale, that's a big piece that people are excited about. I like the fact that um, it's gonna run Linux, which obviously for network compatibility and uh, network cards, there are more supported network cards, I believe, in Linux um, than there are in the BSD world. So I'm hoping you know the better driver and excellent kernel support we get in the Linux world is going to help uh, compatibility with hardware be better on true NAS scale. Um, I don't run a ton of containerization in my NASes. Uh, I run sync thing in them, that's mostly it. I have a couple things at home. So the other nice thing is it's very likely that you'll be able to easily switch um, I don't know this for sure, and I, I don't even know if IX System really has this easy answer, but that you'll be able to take TrueNAS um, based on BSD to TrueNAS scale and flip it over is easy. The reason I say that it should is because it's going to be open ZFS. So you should be able to import your pools. What I know is not going to work, though, is like you're going to break any of your containerization because they're completely different platforms from containerization. But most of the time, it's your data that you care a lot about. So being able to pipe your data over because it's just ZFS, import ZFS pools, away you go. So that's going to be pretty cool. Um, let's see. I have not done anything with Bacula, so it looks, it's not as complete. I kind of, you know, alluded to that um, in in my video where I compared uh, Synology and TrueNAS, that there are backup programs on there, but they're not as complete. Like the active backup in Synology is really nice. Um, it's kind of turnkey. Just turn it on and works and has an installer. Uh, there's, that's why you're asking me for an instruction on Bacula. I've not taken the time. I played with it a little bit and I said, ah, oh, this is, it's not, it looks cool. It doesn't, it, I know if you put the time in, it works. I wish it was a little more polished. So it's not, and I just, I have not myself put the time into it. So I may be underselling it. It may be better than I'm aware of because I have not put the time into it. Oh, uh, let's see. Yeah, if you're replicating the exponology, that's you know that's another option there too. Um, if you have one Synology and one Exponology system, Exponology is a open source copy based on some of the source code from Synology of the Synology Distation Manager. So hopefully that makes sense. It's a hacky way to run your Synology OS on your own hardware. That's probably a good solid way to say that there. To <laughs> uh, do. Anyways, now my overall feelings on TrueNAS though has been, I really like it. Um, hey, perfect timing. Someone said, Alex asked, what's next to me? We're gonna log into what's next to me. This is the um, IX Systems, and this is the free, ma free NAS. I, I said free NAS, it's true NAS. I guess it depends what you wanna log in and how you, I don't know, whatever you wanna call it. Um, yes, there's lots of alerts because whenever I'm done, I flip a switch and just power this thing off. Anyways, this is the true NAS Mini, uh, Mini 3 X Plus. And uh, this has been uh, my testing unit provided by IX Systems. It's got four 10 gig ports in it. So yes, lots of 10 gig connectivity in this thing. And with the beta release, I commented on this earlier in my uh, video talking about it, we have the view enclosure feature working perfectly fine. And seeing as we have view enclosure working fine, we're going to slide a drive out of the NAS live here. I have to refresh the page. So even though we took it out, uh, the page doesn't auto refresh to tell me that the drive's missing. So we'll just click reload that real quick here. I don't even remember what kind of pool I have in here. I know I have a degraded pool now, so. <laughs> One pool, six disks. Is this a Z2? Can it survive two drives being removed or should I just put these back in where they were? Um, oops. So yeah, we're degraded, we know. 
Oh, it is a RAID Z2. So we can actually swap these around. But we know this one was removed. And when we go back over here and look at the enclosure again, you'll just see basically that the uh, enclosure shows one system uh, taken out. So uh, I plan to do some more torture testing now that this is in release Canada because it should do all the proper drive rebuilds and everything else. So we'll go ahead and uh, pop that drive right back in there and uh, give it a second, refresh the page, and it should show back up and resync the moments of data, which there's not much data going on. So I don't think it's really doing much right now. So it'll sync it really fast, especially because these are SSDs. So refresh page. Hey, back online. And then we go back over to our storage, then pools. Yeah, there wasn't any data written, so it didn't do anything. Uh, so no big deal there. But yes, this is the, uh, I did a review on this box right here. This is like directly from IAC systems. And a few people asked me if that view enclosure could work with non IAC systems. And I'm like, not really, because they don't know where you're sticking drives. So that is a little bit of a challenge you may have. Uh, but hey, it works um, quite well with their hardware. And we've been picking up some of these because they're kind of turnkey, uh, making it easy for people who need TrueNAS. This is actually a pretty amazing little box. Granted, it's got solid states in there, but you know, four 10 gig ports, we can really crank some data back and forth into this uh, system right here. And it's nice. And by the way, it's running right now. And it's, I, I guarantee what you're hearing, if you, in case you're wondering what you do here, the AC system in the building is louder than this thing. Um, this thing's super, super quiet. So I've been pretty happy with it. Um, to do now, one of the cool things and why I'm such a big person who, um, yeah, you still not fix your AC. Uh, it's hard to fix because it's the vents. They have to all be changed out to be something quieter and figure out a way to baffle the noise that comes into the ceiling. I don't know. It's, it's, it's not easy to fix. Uh, but what is easy to fix is um, these. These are actually toolless, so we can open up the sides. I did the whole review on it, but even you know, taking off the side to this and everything else, it's still relatively quiet. Um, I really like these boxes. I'm super impressed with them. Now, the other advantage is these boxes are running um, ZFS. That's the whole, the big reason you love the FreeNAS line so much is data integrity you get with ZFS. ZFS is the billion dollar file system. And with the new ZFS, along with the uh, fusion pools and all the new features that you get with it is just next level in terms of the performance is amazing. The updated compression are using Z standard now for the compression. So you've got better compression, fast compression, per data set encryption, and just absolutely amazing speed when you do things like replication, when you do things like um, have to roll something back, how fast that happens on this compared to other devices, like with the way it's implemented in ZFS, it's just so, you know, I don't know, I can't speak enough good to it, when, especially when we've done uh, work on very large systems. And the interesting thing about TrueNAS, this is something I commented on in my uh, comparison video, is you're getting the same software that runs on this little box that you can download and run it on your hardware at home as I sold to companies that spent $50,000 on storage servers um, for each one. So selling those high-end storage servers that were you know, real high availability, failover level, that's just the same software. And that's kind of what's cool about it. It runs at scales at, that the enterprise uses and you can use it at home. And so when people ask about the scalability of it, now there are other challenges and things like that when you wanna run things at scale, different things like HA where you do require uh, some of their systems to make it work. But that's also where TrueNAS scale is gonna be an interesting add-on because some people ask about file systems like um, Ceph and things like that, where you have scalable file systems where each NAS acts like its own piece of an array. Um, I'm working on doing a whole video on the uh, ecosystem of file storage from starting at the hard drives and working your way up to ZFS and working your way up to scalable storage systems. So uh, like GlusterFS specifically, that's, that's the other one I was trying to think of. So I'm going to be um, 
working on that video soon where we break down like from the base level all the way up to the Gluster FS level of, you know, high availability scalable file systems. I've been wanting to do that video because there's a lot of layers to it because Gluster FS makes you think it's a file system, but you don't format your hard drives with Gluster FS. Gluster FS is made up of other systems. So there's there's different component layers and I wanna, I, the, actually the challenge in that video is trying to make sure I articulate it all very accurately and also build some visuals that are gonna go with it. So I'm gonna build like a slide deck to kind of show the layers of how that all works. Um, and that is gonna be, that is a definitely a challenge. So how will scale go and implement things like uh, snapshots and locking with ClusterFS? Yes. <laughs> so that's a, uh, how they're gonna implement it, I'm not sure. So yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I really like it. I want, like I said, I wanna do a dive and a video on it. A matter of fact, the folks over at 45 Drives have some good videos on it. If, you, if you're looking for someone who has something out that you can watch today, uh, you can learn a lot from the people at 45 Drives. They have some videos on, I believe, both Ceph and Gluster. I think they've even got some getting started with Gluster videos uh, and talking about how they work. Um, yes, 45 Drives does have some amazing deep dives. I really like their channel. Um, I've thought about, because they don't have any viewers on their channel. Uh, they don't produce a ton of content, but the content they produce has been pretty good. I thought about like reaching out to them and saying, hey, let's talk about some of these things you guys do and uh, bring them on the channel or something. So it might be kind of fun. Um, do I like the StarTech rack? Yeah, hasn't fallen over. Uh, I don't know, we take things in and out of it all the time when we certainly rolled around the building a lot. So, and we put a lot of these in, I've never had a problem. So it's uh, definitely pretty cool. Um, true scale is not based on GlusterFS. True NAS, oh, oh, true scale. I was thinking, I thought you meant true NAS scale. Yeah, true scale. Uh, I've seen true scale. Uh, what is that? That's the, um, is that the VM so software? Yeah, I can't find it. The, the name's pulling up video games. There's a couple of companies I know that build um, some of their VM stuff on there. Uh, what model? There's a Gen 2 in the rack, and there's a, a Gen 2 Pro and a whatever the other one is. Just a 16-port PoE. That's what's in the rack right now. Oh, there's also a 10-gig uh, uh, Unify switch in the rack as well. So, all fun stuff. Yeah, uh, we are still using Bitwarden. I see people talking about it. Uh, I know some people do like the Bitwarden RS. I like the officially supported Bitwarden from Bitwarden. Uh, we pay for uh, the full version, I guess you could say, the enterprise uh, one on there. So, it's. Uh, I've been really happy with Bitwarden. That's actually worked out really well. Yeah, that's no no complaints of Bitwarden for sure. Um, and no complaints about the true NAS box here. It's, we've been moving, now that it's in release candidate, I'm moving all of my systems to it. And I guess I just did a video about that earlier today. So, uh, yeah, hybrid is not caching, storing, it's storing metadata. That's actually why it's hard to, people say, oh, I need to set it this way or that way. That's really hard to say exactly how you should build, especially with the new fusion pools on there, which is gonna be the most efficient for you. It comes down to what is your use case. And you know, there's certain, um, I believe like the metadata one, and they're doing the homework, don't worry, over at IAC Systems doing the testing, so they're gonna have some released information on this. There's gonna be scenarios, essentially. What is a scenario? What is it that you're using it for? You're going to stick a database on this, Okay, you wanna do it this way. You're gonna use VM storage on this. Okay, this is the settings you want for that. This is the way you wanna build that pool. You just want to use it for video editing and to dump large files on. Well, that's a different use case than maybe having a large number of users with lots of small files. There's gonna be different setups that are gonna be more optimal one way or another. And 
that's just the way it's going to be when you build these. There's not like one answer solves all the problems when you're building out these pools, but that's the, gonna be the flexibility is being able to build the pool and design the pool to be the most optimum for your workload. Um, and that's why so much depends on your workload, but that's also the you know, brilliance of ZFS is being able to be flexible and have options for different types of workload environments. Yeah, well, TrueNAS scale isn't based on GlusterFS. It has GlusterFS. There's a difference. They didn't, you don't start with GlusterFS. You start with like ZFS and then you add Gluster built into it. So yes, TrueNAS scale has GlusterFS built into it. That's not the same saying it's built on it. You don't build it on, you add GlusterFS in there. So it can, so all the TrueNAS scale devices can be part of a Gluster is, which is a cluster of Gluster servers. So yes, it's not that I'm, uh, um, can you demonstrate the hybrid fusion pools? That is on my to-do list. Um, the, the challenge comes into that you have to, um, I have to build the test environment, which I have. Matter of fact, I reloaded this back here, took TrueNAS off, set it up with a, um, XCPNG turned on multipath IO and I'm going to try to load this up and I'm going to try to rebuild the pools with different scenarios on them um, because I have to create a specific VM then I have to create a specific repeatable workload and then take that repeatable workload and load it on here run it through its cycles get all the baseline numbers change it out to another pool Put the workload back on here, run it through its uh, numbers, change out the fusion pool to a different type again with a different configuration, reload it, run it through its numbers. The challenge comes into that's just time consuming and time is finite. I have so much of it to do so many things. So while I think that might be popular, um, I don't know. It, I would have to forego a lot of other things because that's a lot of hours in the lab setting that up. So as much as I want to do it, I'm kind of relying a little bit on the people at IX Systems to do it. Um, or if someone could just throw big piles of money at me to do it, then I would say, well, okay, I'm making money and I do this now. <laughs> and that's, that is a challenge when doing these lab things. I've always really, really appreciated Pharonix. They do some heavy loading, heavy testing. Uh, I use the Pharonix suite as well. They do a great job on it, but there's a lot of hours that go into some of that testing. So uh, that's a lot to think about. I, I wanna do some of the tests. I will undoubtedly do some. I don't know how extensive I will get in my testing. That's the uh, rant. But all you guys asking me to do is of course encouraging me to do it. And I do love doing it. I mean, it's certainly a lot of fun and winter is coming. So I will spend less time outside on my motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, metadata load is hard to do repeatable. There, that's the thing. There's a whole lot of thing on that. So uh, on the video of Huntress, they said, don't reuse passwords. Um, how do you manage that, Bitwarden? Bitwarden makes that easy. Uh, Repeatable workload. Good job for Docker. No, good job for uh, Pharonix test suite. Pharonix test suite, you pick out, um, if you haven't used Pharonix test suite, I should do a video on it because I really, um, as I've learned Pharonix test suite and how to do more things with it, I'm really impressed with the automation levels you can get in there. Uh, it, it's great. Once you create a VM and you get your Pharonix test suite on there, it will even build all the charts for you automatically. So you can take one VM and say, build all the charts as I do it. So every time I put the VM on a, and on a data set, I just back that VM up, up after it's done so I can destroy it, reload this, put the VM back on there, it'll pick up where it left off and it'll create one consolidated chart. And each cycle I run, I name that cycle and it uploads automatically to the Pharonix site all the different charts with all the descriptions. So I name each fusion pool, what type I did it on in the Pharonix test suite for each time I run the cycle. I run a repeatable cycle. So I run the same exact set of tests with the only difference being the pool and I label them all and it produces a chart you guys can go look at. That's cool. And um, so that's that's gonna be a uh, how I end up doing that. Um, do I have experience connecting switches with fiber in different buildings? Yep. Uh, 
I, I don't know, you plug fiber in both ends and one, one's in one building, one's in the other building. I guess I don't understand is the question. Yes, we've done it quite a few times. Uh, you know, even dealt with directional underground boring to get the fiber from point A to point B. Um, what do I ride? Oh, we're almost to that. It is five o'clock. I am going to end this, um, and I'll give you guys about 10 more minutes because I do got some stuff to do today. Um, but yes. Uh, um, there are all kinds of challenges with Pharonix when you're looking at file system tests. So there's a lot of different options on there. Look for some of them been deprecated as well. Hit the bash button. So that's a whole nother uh, thing. So, uh... I have already covered the SMR and CMR. I've did some videos on it. Serve the Home did more videos on it uh, than I did. And I've, we've talked back and forth. We've tweeted each other's uh, topics on there. CMR is beat to death. Uh, we already know it sucks. So, <laughs> um, or, or the SMR, CMR debate. I'm, I'm over it. We, we know what's bad, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let's see. No, Unify Protect is still active. Yeah, I don't know what else we can say about SMR and CMR. You're right. <laughs> uh, what was I talking about? Doing testing and motorcycles. Oh, motorcycles. We'll talk about motorcycles real quick. Hit that like button while I talk about motorcycles. Um, people ask what I ride. I will pull a photo up of it because uh, I'm curious. I did get a new bike. So because I bought a new bike, um, I have that. So that is the new beast I've been riding. It is a... Uh, Yamaha Super Tenere, and that thing is just a 1200 cc, 800 or five, I'm sorry, 584 pound motorcycle dirt bike um, with all kinds of torque, and uh, it's definitely been fun. So that's definitely been um, some exercise wrestling that thing around. And someone had asked me the other day. They said, "Hey, do you uh, do you still?" this real quick someone asked me if I still have my old Honda and yes um, I still like to ride my old Honda in the woods because some of the places I go in the woods are real sketchy like this bridge I ride across and uh, I could probably pick the Honda up if it fell in the creek under the bridge I guarantee I cannot pick up a 584 pound motorcycle out of a creek so where I ride in my sketchy, narrow places uh, for really technical off-roading, I use the Honda. And then when I want to go on a road trip, uh, I take the giant um, Tenere, which matter of fact, I took it to, this is uh, Hell, Michigan. I rode the motorcycle out to Hell. So that way I can say this is um, not too far, but I, I can now say I've taken the motorcycle to Hell and back. Any new bike I get, I usually ride it out to Hell and back because Hell, Michigan's a cool place, but yeah, that's um, that's what I usually ride right now. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Did we have the obligatory Mikrotik question? Not yet, but hey, Mikrotik, why not? Uh, let's see. Hey, I'm glad to hear it says, uh, Jay says he's a new subscriber and is now getting into, um, now getting into Linux. And that is awesome to hear. I, I'm, I want to do an in-depth getting started with Linux video too. That is on my list of things because I'm such a Linux enthusiast. I like getting more people into it. It is harder to talk someone into using Linux than actually using Linux. That's the, that's my takeaway from all my Linux stuff. Uh, would I buy a Model S? Yeah, probably. Um, I have a Model 3. I love my Model 3. When I get a Model S, I don't have a problem with the Model S. I do like them. My friend has, I have more than one friend that's got one. And uh, they like them. I like them. Um, I, I don't really have the extra 100, 100 something thousand to get a loaded up Model S right now. But I, um, I like them. I, I just don't really have the extra money because I just bought a house. <clears throat> so, anyways. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, the way Meeker Tick is, Meeker Tick and Ubiquity are in different worlds for the most part. Uh, Meeker Tick does not have the management levels that you get with Unify. So I, it's not like it's, like I said, people like to say they're going to abandon ship. That's fine. Go ahead. Um, what would you recommend getting started in Linux? It all depends what you want to do. Start with a goal that actually helps when you're getting started with Linux. 
uh, go ahead and start with like what do you want to accomplish you want to learn Kali Linux for hacking or you want to just use it as your daily usage like I do and I'm running right now um, this is uh, pop OS so pull it up real quick um, this is my daily usage computer and this is a you know Intel Core i5 running on a laptop here uh, running pop OS I find pop OS to be really easy for even new people to start it's based on Ubuntu so the only thing you have to remember if you're trying to troubleshoot something on here is just look for the equivalent instead of saying how do I do something in pop OS you might ask the question how do I do this in Ubuntu because they work very fundamentally the same so it's not it's not too bad I don't think it's hard to get started in it it's not you don't like, you don't spend a lot of time on the command line like people seem to assume you do and look I'm running a browser or I can open up another browser and still do a lot of the same things you do inside of most Windows computers without all that pesky stupid updates and breaking and uh, things like that yeah I like I said pop OS I see people already throwing in there and this is also what I think turns off people to Linux is this constant debate where everyone has to uh, evangelize their own distribution. You have to use Linux Mint. It's Linux Mint or nothing. And by the way, I use Arch and you should use it too and things like that. I like things that just kind of work and I feel that Pop! OS does a great job and one of the, the great jobs they do is the Pop Shop. And uh, they've just done a great job compared to some of the other uh, distros of going, hey, I want a tool. How do I load that particular tool? How do I load this graphics tool? How do I load Steam on here? And Steam is one of those ones that, yes, you can load Steam on Ubuntu, but Steam on Pop! OS, there's not that. You can load it, but you have to do these couple extra things. Pop! OS does those couple extra things. Now, it's been a little while since I use Ubuntu, so I can't speak to say if the latest, event, latest version of Ubuntu has any issues or not. But many of the things you will find, such as Signal, uh, maybe people like Telegram, Spotify, a lot of those functionality you can bring right here. And uh, if you want some, like I said, they got games, engineering, they broke all these down, office productivity apps, development. For, so if you're into development, there is all kinds of development tools that you can load on here and they make it pretty easy to do. You just click them and install them. Matter of fact, the video editing software is... I love how this works on here. It just, it stays up to date. It's so, I used to think it crashed a lot until I learned from my other YouTube friends just how much Adobe crashes. And they're blown away that one, Caden Live is free, two, it renders faster than Adobe, and three, it doesn't crash as much as Adobe. So what I used to think was a lot of crashing apparently is not even a lot of crashing compared to people who use Adobe. <laughs> so um, it's, yeah, I can't say enough good things about running Pop! OS. It's been pretty, I've been pretty happy with it. Uh, lag for NFS and HAI SCSI. Um, I don't know if that's a question or a statement. Uh, Pop Shop, to my knowledge, is its own thing. I don't know if it's based on elementary OS, but that's where it gets confusing occasionally in the Linux world because, um, everyone borrows from each other in an open source world. So there's not like a definitive answer all the time of you can see something, you can like it, and you can copy it over to your side, just in form, not necessarily in code even, because it was a good idea. So I don't know, I haven't used elementary OS. I don't know if they share any code with it. I know they've done a great job on Pop! OS and a Pop! Shop, making it super easy to handle both updates. They've also done a great job of something I'm a big fan of is, uh, full disk encryption out of the box. They make it just bulletproof easy to install on Pop! OS. So um, that's something else I'm gonna go and say is, is great. Uh, Caden Live may have more Windows issues. That's probably true. I've, I've heard people tell me this. I just don't use it in Windows, so I can't answer that question. Uh, I've heard people tell me though, Caden Live doesn't work as well in Windows. I, I Okay, I use it in Linux where it works extremely well, so I don't know. Um, I am running a Lenovo L480. Uh, I did a review on this laptop, and uh, I've been happy with it. I mean, it's an older model. I don't remember how old this one is. It's maybe a year or two years old. Um, for what I do, because I don't really edit 
videos on this, it works great. If you were going to do some video editing or something like that, this is probably not the laptop for you. If you are a network professional like uh, I am and use it for things like that, we have a couple USB-C ports. We have a network jack on the side. That is what I like. So we got two USB-Cs so I can use multiple monitors when I'm at home. And uh, we have a network jack, which means I don't have to hang a USB dongle for a network interface on it. That's kind of what I look for in a laptop. Uh, yes, Pop! OS is still my main video editing system as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if you type in like on my YouTube channel, Ryzen Pop! OS, that Ryzen system I built is still what I use for uh, video editing. It works great. I'm really happy with it. Uh, do, 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 do. uh, single password to unlock disk on boot. I, I'm not sure that question. Um, DaVinci Resolve looks interesting. I don't really want to take the time to learn it because DaVinci Resolve has more features than Caden Live. I know, especially when it comes to color grading and some of the input options, it's got some awesome options. I don't use them. I, I, have, I don't know, 1200 videos on my channel. And um, I haven't felt compelled, excuse me, I haven't felt compelled to add all the features you would get. I will admit, DaVinci Resolve has better titling in it. I'm, I'm hoping one day they get better at doing some fancy titles, but also I can live without fancy titles because they're just, like I said, fancy titles. Uh, using Caden Live means I have to focus on presenting things on my screen and presenting them in an articulate fashion, not putting a bunch of flashy graphics on here. I don't think flashy graphics would make my channel better. If someone thinks I'm wrong about that and they think just flashy graphics would help, let me know, but yeah. Uh, DaVinci Resolve is, it does have really good color correction. It also has really good um, effects. Like if you're doing green screening and uh, where you wanna say, hey, put this here and that there, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, green screen and motion tracking, all that's amazing. And I love the fact that all that's built in. So that's a really cool feature, but one, I'm not doing motion tracking ever. Um, I don't really ever do green screening. So it's it's got all kinds of bells and whistles I'll never use. Uh, bonus for those wondering though, it does work cross-platform on Windows and Linux. That's a cool thing feature. It's not open source, but it does support Linux. And I know some video editors that really like DaVinci Resolve. Matter of fact, one of the scalable features of DaVinci Resolve is instead of saving files, it can save everything to databases in the back end. So multiple people can work on a single project uh, because they can share the database. So there's some, oh, if I had multiple editors that needed simultaneous editing work, there's another feature because I edit everything myself. That's another feature that DaVinci Resolve has, but I don't need. So I have looked at it, as you can tell. I've, I've dug into it in the early days and I settled with Caden live and I've been happy. Yeah, smash the like button, all 374 of you here. Yeah, DaVinci Resolve and the Black Magic stuff. I believe they're all the same company and it's pretty cool. So, uh, nope, everything in this right now is just one RAID Z2 pool. Eventually, I will do something different with it, but right now I'm not. Uh, we've just been testing it as a RAID Z2 and running VMs and running things on it. Uh, well, running it as a storage for VMs. I don't care much for the virtual machine manager inside of uh, FreeNAS, TrueNAS, so. Hopefully that makes sense. Well, I'm gonna wind it down here, folks. If there's any questions, comments, or concerns, uh, I'll give you two more minutes to answer all those questions. If there's not, um, then everyone have a wonderful day. So I'm going to go ride. Well, I don't know if I'm going to ride a motorcycle today or not, uh, but I've got stuff I want to go out and do and fun stuff like that. Um, here, leave you pictures. Uh, this is, this is a nice thing. You don't have to go too far here in Detroit uh, from where I'm at, at least. This is just, this is only like 10 more miles, 15 more miles south of where I'm at right now. So a uh, short drive away, I can get out into the country and I like playing around on dirt roads. That's why I bought a big dirt bike. <laughs> so they're they're kind of fun. And where else did I go? I didn't think I went anywhere else interesting. Not more dirt roads, pretty pictures. I like taking photos. Um, occasionally I tweet them out and share them, but that's a, that's a here and there thing. Mostly I just take them for my own good. Just say, this is where I was at this particular time. 
Oh, I did do this. Uh, I, I didn't take a picture of falling in the mud because I was so covered in mud I didn't want to take my phone out. I did fall in that though. Um, I, I, I know how to pick the bike up in the mud and I was soaked and the bike was soaked, but that was part of the fun. I was splashing through the woods and it was raining. So I may go do more of that. Any more questions? Let me see if any more came in here. Uh, yeah, Da Vinci's level 11 complicated. I don't need complicated. Uh, Netgate SG 2100. I like it. It's out of my reach because it's over there. I, I did a review on it. Thumbs up through the SG 2100. Uh, time to think of a Ducati Multistrada. Yeah, I tell you, people tell me that Tenere is a lot more reliable. I looked at the Multistrada. The reviews told me to get to Tenere. Um, I talked to even a Tenere owner, even the mechanic. Um, I met a mechanic, and that's why he bought it. He's a motorcycle mechanic that works on all these different models. He liked the Tenere. He says it's, he likes it because it doesn't break down. <laughs> so... Um, any videos? I don't know. Maybe I'll do a helmet cam. I have a personal channel. Um, if you Google Tom Lawrence, you can probably find it somewhere. Maybe I'll do some videos on that. So and I guess my son wants me to call him. So I'm going to wander off here. Uh, you watched old video. I got thinner. Yes, I did. I lost probably 30 pounds, uh, maybe more. Um, I definitely have lost a lot of weight and try to stay in better shape now. Uh, once you get over 40, um, things don't, you, you know you're going to have health problems, so you start doing things to mitigate and eat healthier and running more and being more active, which is why i got to get away from behind the keyboard right now. So uh, I, I don't even know the name of my second channel. It's just, it's just Thomas Lawrence. If you look for me, I'm not too hard to find. Uh, if you look for, I don't know. If it's in my la I linked it in my last live stream. How's that? I, I, there's, I don't have the link to it ready. I literally can't. I have to go. I, if I switch, I have to switch and end this live stream to do it, to switch to the other channel, create the URL because it doesn't have a vanity URL. It's my personal channel. and uh, But, yeah, I don't really post much on it, so don't get too excited yet. There's very little on there. If I start an actual personal channel, which I have thought about doing, where I just babble on about my personal projects I do, like riding motorcycles because someone might be interested, they don't have any business on this channel. I'm not going to clutter this channel with me babbling on about my love of bicycles and motorcycles or whatever it is I'm doing, but someone may be interested in that. And I get it because I have a few videos on my personal channel <clears throat> where I talk about some old scooters and they have like eight or 9,000 views. So someone apparently cared about my old scooter as much as I did. So uh, maybe I will do that, but that's a future date. That's not really today. There's not much on there. So, uh, Tom Offroad Man, something like that. Uh, you can, I don't care if you link it in a stream. Anyone who can drop, wants to drop it in there, feel free. What is your, uh, mitigation on your business continuity in case you're not available? Uh, my staff is well trained. I am very unavailable. Um, I am, uh, you, you train staff to do it. So my mitigation is, um, that the world does not revolve around me. I am not the business owner who built my business to revolve around me. I watch IT people do this all day. And they think that the world revolves around them and then you build a business that they become absolutely married to that they can't leave. Um, it, it, you have to really think about that. I, I used to work in corporate and I purposely would delegate a lot of things. And I brought that mentality over to my business. You compartmentalize things, you train people to do and handle things and you manage things by exception. That way you can work on the business, not in the business as the old adage goes. But the goal is to be able to make bigger decisions and not be burdened with everything coming to you. I know business owners, some of them are micromanagers and they just, yeah, they want to be the center of the world and no thing can happen in their business without them. That scales only to the ability of that person to scale it. I'm saying I've seen multi-million dollar companies run by a micromanager. It can be done. That person loves it. They're, they live off the energy of being in the middle of it all. That is not me. So my mitigation is training people to handle everything. Um, you notice I sit here for, what, an hour and 15 minutes and I got how many you know, emergencies or interruptions from my staff. They're all working over there. Matter of fact, they're thrilled when Tom's here because he's not bothering them about something. <laughs> so, yeah, Elon Musk is a whole, some level of difference. So he's I, somewhere in between a micromanager and a delegator. I read his book and any, I've read enough interviews. Elon's a mystery and a pretty interesting person overall. I like his cars and his space things. So, all right, thanks. Maintaining a knowledge base. No, uh, process procedures, documents in a knowledge base, not just a knowledge base of throat information. So 
All right, guys, that's it. I'm glad to everyone hit the like button. And if you are watching this on post, hopefully hit the like button. Appreciate it.